Hola. No, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hola. <laughs> Christ. B -b Bonjour. Ni hao. And let's start this again. Slam dunk, are you ready to make me? Hola. Bonjour. Ni hao. Privet. Hello. Moi. Guten Tag. Namaste. Konnichiwa. Salam. Whatever way you want to say it. Welcome to the Normal Not Normal podcast with me, Oliver Phelps. And me, James Phelps. Guys, thank you very much for joining us this week. In this series, we're talking some of our favourite people about what normal means to them and to ask, well, does normal even exist? Yeah, and today we're really excited to chat with our guest, who is a sports broadcaster, Kelly Cates. Now, Kelly had an early taste of fame because her father is footballing royalty. Footballing legend, former player, former manager, Sir Kenny Dalgleish. Kelly inherited a love of football and went on to become one of the UK's best-loved sports broadcasters. She's informed, inspired and entertained football fans all over the world with a presenter for Sky Sports, Radio 5 Live, ITV, ESPN, Channel 5, Talk Sport, you name it, she's been on it. And in fact, she was the first female host on Talk Sport at the time when the industry was extremely male dominated. So Kelly has been at the centre of some of the most hard-hitting interviews in sports and was also involved in a documentary about the Hillsborough disaster. So for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the Hillsborough disaster, it was an absolutely t terrible event that happened in England in 1989 at the semi-final of the FA Cup at the Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, uh, which basically had the crushing of 96 Liverpool supporters and following on from that, the total miscarriage of justice that subsequently happened from that the fabrication in newspapers and Kelly's documentary really brings all that home in such an amazing amazing way and definitely worth a listen but we'll talk about more of that in the show but Kelly I need to give you a heads up joins us from her kitchen table where she's been doing her broadcast from pretty much at the moment due to the whole pandemic and everything going on like there so you may hear her daughters in the background but you know as this is all about normal life what better way to do it? And they listen to the podcast, so we'll let them off. In fact, we'll actively encourage them. But they were being very great. So thank you very much for joining us today, Kelly. But can I, can I start? First of all, I've got a rant to do this week. What? And I know I, I know I like to give the impression that I'm a very chilled out. I'm the chilled out one of the group, right? Here we go. Here we go. I'm just going to sit back and watch you unwind. So, but you need okay. to start it with, why is it? You've got your drum, so I'm going to get my guitar. Oh. Let's find an angry... Oh, is this, is this going to be like... Oh, I thought then you were going to do like a Clarissa Explains It All when the next door neighbour used to walk in. Hey, Sam. Meow. There we go. Though, <laughs> that, that, is, that is age appropriate, that one. God, if you know what I'm talking about there. Anyway, how do you start... A Run. Why is it? I'm I'm not used to doing them for. Why is it? Okay. I need to put my guitar down so I can injure it. Right. See, there's a... Come on. Prepare myself. So today I try to get tickets for the Rugby World Cup, which is happening in France in 2023. You had to, first of all you had to pre pre uh, join the club to get into the pre-sale. After that. I get on. They said tickets are going to go on sale on 11, p 11 a.m. English time. I get on. No luck. Not working. Come back again, it says on the website. Try again in an hour. Eventually you get in the queue. Nothing's happening. It just keeps going into a buffing zone. You're in a queue. You're in a queue. Four hours later, I'm eventually allowed into the room to get tickets. Once I get in there, all the good tickets have gone. You have to then pay silly amounts for silly money, but a few of my friends are like, OK, let's do it. It's the World Cup. We want to go. I then have to put in my the tickets into the basket six times because it kept coming up empty, 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 empty. When I eventually get to check out, it says, sorry, all tickets are now sold out. Done. 
whole waste of the day trying to get tickets for the Rugby World Cup. Useless website, it's 2021. Surely there is a better way of making a website which is fair for everybody, like a ballot system, for example, like the Olympics. The Olympics was a great way of doing it because you could choose many different things to go to and then eventually you eventually got into them by if you were accepted or not. Anyway, you done. Enough about that. I hope everyone that got tickets are very happy. Yeah, but by the sound of it, they'd just be ticket touts anyway because just playing into that. I think you will be. That's the problem. It will be ticket touts because then when they ticket touts go on sale, then they up up all the price. That's why it's so expensive to go to games and sports and everything these days. Oh, never buy tickets from touts because it's their fault that prices cost so much anyway. The, the fact of the matter is I love live sport. I've craved right live sport because live sport has been missing so much, especially the last year. And I really, yes. really just want to get back to it. In fact, that's something mm. I want to chat to Kelly about is what is it like presenting sport from an empty stadium? There's a question to ask. You see, that's the thing, because you couldn't even buy tickets for just one game, which you would think would be the case, right? Oh. You bought well. at least, you could only buy at least four tickets for four games. So, I mean, touts are going to love this. Yeah. It does not make sense. We could we as could do it. We could do a normal, not normal them. from the world from the World Cup, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah, sure. As long as people, as long as genuine fans going, I don't care if I missed out. That's the thing. Selfless. And I mean that. No, it, it's true. It's true. And I'm sure every sporting fan will agree with me. And let's face it, touts suck. Uh, well know. then, there you go. Can I ask what your? Can, hang on. I noticed this earlier. So we're speaking to what? Kelly, who works all things football. Yes. Have you got a captain's armband on your arm? No, these are my... So, look. <laughs> I've got my shirt. These are the cuffs. <laughs> oh, I thought you were wearing a captain's there's armband there's on your right well. arm. Well, wear a <laughs> captain's <laughs> armband. I'm not yeah. a bloody idiot, am I? You're the one who woke up today and chose anger, by the sound of it. I didn't. I really did. It's The thing is, you expect... when you're. I'm sure everyone has had to deal with stuff online and it hasn't gone the way that they expected it to that's just how it happens that's that's it it's not going to be the worst thing in the world the, the more important thing if it is to accept it that this is what's happened and move on you there can't you change what happened today you can make tomorrow better so like oliver's saying today we're speaking to kelly cates who's again we've seen her on on the tv for for many years and listened to her on the radio for many years i'm sure if you watched if ever seen a Premier League show nine times out of ten, she's done a presenting of at least one of the shows you have watched around the world. Very knowledgeable about all things football. And what we've come to discover, a really, really nice person. So everybody, without further ado, let's all welcome Kelly Cates. Cool. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you so much for asking me. Well, thank you very much for coming. I know that we were uh, hopefully trying to get you on at some point. So thank you very much. We're very excited. Yeah, well, so am I. I'm looking forward to it. I've listened to quite a few of and the old one, the Double Trouble one. Yeah. So I'm kind of, I'm across oh, it. Good. I know I'm comfortable. This <laughs> that's is good. good. Yeah, hopefully yeah. you can see that this one's slightly a bit more professional. I dare say professional. A bit more. Very much you so, can, yeah, more produced. Exactly, yeah, you can tell, you can tell we've got a producer involved this uh, this season round. But yeah. anyway, so, so yeah, so like a basic, basic intro to this, how we came about it is... Um, for those who are listening, who maybe haven't listened to any of the other ones, um, especially as twins, we we'll always ask, what's it like, you know, growing up with a twin and stuff like that? What's your normal? So we we're basically trying to work out, you know, does normal even exist? Like, what is what is normal and how does it go? But for you, like, what was the same for you? Like, because we we're obviously asked, what's it like being a twin? And we don't know anything different. But for, say, yourself with, uh, say, like your dad, for example, having... Yeah, so your, your dad, Kenny Dalgleish. Someone say to you, what's it like growing up with a dad like yourselves? Is the answer the same as ours? Like, well, that's our normality. That's, that's what we know. Yeah, that's the thing. It's because there's nothing to compare it to. And I think normal is something that you think other people are. And, and, your, own, and your own life is just exactly how it is. And, but, but even then, I think even by those standards, I think it was a relatively normal upbringing because, you know, I didn't spend my time we did go to the games, but then I didn't spend my time at celebrity parties. This isn't mm. this isn't like David Beckham being a footballer. <laughs> this is a very different era, and so we'd go to the games and things. But it wasn't um, it wasn't particularly glamorous, you know. You'd be in a little office at the end of the 
at the corridor and the, the sort of the players lounge was all sort of shades of beige and you know it's <laughs> had a sort of they don't even sell alcohol or sell alcohol they don't give them alcohol in them anymore but I just remember it had that kind of slightly stale pub smell to it and yeah. <laughs> so it was um it wasn't it wasn't as glamorous in the way that football is now and then at home well home was home it was it was just you know you close the door and it was about doing your homework and getting to school on time and that kind of thing. Rightly so. <laughs> I've got to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I say that's the, that's the kind of parent I've turned into now as well. I've sort of I have to do as I say, not as yeah, I do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as as a child, were you aware of like how big your dad was in the game of football, um, and especially in in um, Liverpool, not- but more in general. Yeah, you. not so much. Only because uh, yeah, only because my. Um, so my school friends were the same all the way through. I sort of changed school at, at nine, but I still had the same sort of friends. And then all the way through, it was the same group of people. So they were bored of it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't interesting to them um, what my dad did. But I remember being probably about nine or ten, actually. And I went to a Rod Stewart concert with my mum and dad in Glasgow <laughs> at Ibrox. <laughs> And um, because because I was a really cool nine year old um, and we went to see Rod Stewart and people were sort of shouting at him from the crowd. We walked around the inside of the pitch to get to our seats and people were sort of shouting at him. And I remember that vividly because although I was kind of aware of um, of what he did, it wasn't really that big a deal to me. And then suddenly I went, oh, other people are interested. This is this is really strange. Mm-hmm. Because I spent a lot of time around the club and with other players' kids. So it's a bit like my dad plays football. Yeah, well, so does mine. Yeah, sure, which yeah. point? <laughs> no, good. So in terms of like when you say like, like at home, a normal week, like what would be a normal weekend for you? Would that be, as you say, hanging out with your mates, maybe going to the odd game, but that would be about it. Like the same as, well, as you say, like yeah. normality as it would be. Yeah, exactly. Um, on, on the subject of being normal... <laughs> My supermarket delivery is just about... <laughs> it's a bit... <laughs> Do you need to get, get him it? on? Get, it, just, get him on the show. Get him on the show, yeah. Two seconds, only because I think there's wine in it, so the kids can't okay. get it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Here, okay. Do you need to... <laughs> nicest... Yes. The, Do you want to put your frozen away? The nicest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, no, there's nothing okay. frozen. There's, I just said that to him. I went, are there any frozen bags? I'm like, he's like, no, no, no. <laughs> he's the nicest man in the world. He's like, you take care, stay safe. I'll see you next time. I was like, oh, I've made a yeah. friend. <laughs> it's always the way. Just, like, we, um, <laughs> we actually got a, a chat delivered our, our groceries last uh, the week before last, sorry. And he was saying... Lots of lovely greens and vegetables. Like it's really healthy, isn't it? This, you know. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, trying not. This week, a takeaway curry arrived at this exact same moment that he's given us these foods, and I think it's just totally <laughs> shattered any illusion of what's, uh, yeah, what a yeah. fraudulent thing what we're living. Oh, well, it's all. But the thing is, I, I mean, now I feel like I'm going to be judged because I think I've got so much rubbish in there. I just, it's like, I'm now a bit worried. Although I'm, I'm, um, I'm on a low alcohol thing at the moment, so I think it's got lots of there is there is wine in there, but there's I think some of that, um, you know, that gin that isn't gin and that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So They're actually, yeah. really good. So aren't if they? he's looking through, he's going to think I'm really well behaved. I'm surprised how good they how good they tasted. Yeah, I like them. They're, they're actually, you, you feel, it feels like a treat. It doesn't feel like you're sort of abstaining in the yeah. same way. Anyway, back on track. So th- it, obviously that, that brought perks to the um, to it. Like I've seen, going to see Rod Stewart and taking in all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that was the big one. That was one. a big one. <laughs> so did, but did you ever get a time where you resented football? Like as a kid, like, oh, I don't want to go to the game today. I don't want to do anything like that. Um. I think there was there was a point where I maybe had a couple of years of not going just because it was the it was being different. So I think maybe I don't know ten or eleven something like that. I stopped going for a couple of years, um, and then I sort of said as though I was kind of doing them a big favour. I said to my mum, "I think I'd really like to go to the first game of the season. So you know this is <laughs> this is an event, and I will be there for this." <laughs> Um, and I went and I thought, what the hell am I doing? Why am I not there every week? I thought, well, every other week. I love it. So, yeah, that's when I, I started going back. Yeah, okay. And did you did you feel like you wanted to play football growing up? That that was always something that you were, like you wanted to do? Obviously, the women's game, I suppose, in the last, what, five years, it's gone on to a t- totally different level, hasn't it? Um, 
But even then, though, did you still want to play at some at some degree? No, it wasn't really something that was open to me. I, I never felt. I think um, it wasn't something that people did in the in the in the way that my brother would go and the first thing they'd do when they went into school was start kicking a ball around in the playground, mm. and that would be everything that they did. Every break, every both of you are yeah. nodding. Yeah. I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, but it's. <laughs> But, but that, that just wasn't the same um, for the girls in, in my year. And I think, you're right, it has changed. But I think even, even now, like, I've got daughters and they're not as bothered as I thought they might be. You know, it's still, it's, they, they're, they sort of have an interest and they quite like kicking a ball around and they like it when it's, you know, football lessons in PE. But they're not, they don't love it in the same mm, way. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I guess I, I mean I I loved it, but I was always like the the trier. I was never I was never going to make it. <laughs> then again, I'm a Birmingham City fan, so that's probably why. Um, <laughs> I said when you said that you didn't want to go. I remember my the reason I didn't want to go again is when I saw Birmingham lose at home two 0 to Kidderminster Harriers. So that was. I can see that. I, I can see that that. But the highlight was the, a dog <laughs> running on the pitch, and that's why is that always the thing that you remember as a kid. <laughs> it is and also that's even now it's like if something like that happens that's it's like the best thing ever or if i don't know some obscure game in some country miles away and and there's a squirrel on the pitch or something it goes viral everybody wants to see it i don't know <laughs> <Yeah>. why <laughs> oh you get and often you get one of the players often it's like the goalie or something will go over and sort of nurture this little animal and just kind of shoo them off the pitch very gently <laughs> So, you, I mean, you've you've got an incredible career of your own, um, presenting and all over the world in doing so. So, did you always want to work in sport? But because I, I know you were at university when you went into media, can you tell us all about that and what you were doing leading up to it? Yeah, I was doing a maths degree, and funnily enough, I didn't really have a strong impulse to carry on when I got offered a job working in football telly. <laughs> um, and I just I just didn't know what I wanted to do with it. I had no idea where it was going to lead to or what was going to happen. And then Sky Sports News set up and they um, they just basically took a load of kids in from straight from university and said, go and practice making telly. We'll put a couple of grown-ups in there to make sure you don't completely mess it up. But go and, go and play, go and have fun. And um, it was just... It was great. It was such a brilliant, brilliant time because we were all at the same stage of our lives. We were all in our early 20s. Um, a lot of us had moved down to London for the first time. And so we, we worked together, but it was our whole social life as well. That they, they were our friends as well as our, you know, our colleagues. So it was, really, it was a really, really good, fun time. And there was no pressure because when we first went on air, nobody could watch us. It was the launch of Sky Digital mm. Platform. So... Um, it hadn't even, I think, officially been launched when the channel launched, so you could only watch it in the building. <laughs> and then at Christmas, they launched the, the new sort of little dishes. And I used to get so excited going down the road and you'd see the little dishes. And I'd be like, they can get the Thank channel. They can get the channel. <laughs> yeah. And it was, like, it was really exciting. Um, whether they watched it or not was a different thing, but they could get well, it. Because it went on to be the biggest, the, the the biggest channel most ever, watched it? channel on Sky, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, at times. Certainly on things like Transfer Deadline yeah. Day. Um, and, and those big kind of event moments. I think the transfer deadline day with um, Manchester City with the takeover. That was the craziest that was day ever, wasn't when, it? That? Yeah. yeah. That was absolutely crazy. Yeah. yeah. That was, I think, at the time, that was their, their highest ever viewing figures. And I think that was a real moment mm. for, for Sky Sports Yeah, news. And then the days of them standing outside the uh, the training grounds and then people coming in with... <laughs> Yeah, they had yeah. to stop that. I think I think the one outside the of Everton is probably the, uh, the famous <laughs> one, isn't it? But, yeah. um, when you went into it then, Kelly, was it a case of, as you, as you say, like there's a load of guys who are like, you're roughly the same age and going into it. Did you practice together outside? Like, you know, how you would do an interview with people or how you would adapt on the fly? Because it's all live TV, isn't it? So it's breaking news and especially with sport yeah. being such a... I suppose polarizing and territorial thing as well. You can get some real blinkered views about something. So, do you learn to, on the way to how you approach it or how you talk to people about it? We did. Um, we had a week. <laughs> we had a week of training <laughs> before we went on air with a really lovely man, actually. And he was um, his his whole um, sort of approach was was very psychological. So it was lots of the interviewing techniques that he taught us were about how to draw the best out of people and how to kind of get people to open up when maybe they didn't want to and how to kind of... Ma- and, and also, really, given how 
young and inexperienced we all were, especially the, you know, for the for those of us going in front of camera, it was just about relaxing and and be. But you must have had this for a lot of the a lot of the guys on set. It must have been a similar sort of thing where it's your first sort of big. I mean, we were older. We were you know in our early twenties, but there's still that thing of everything being brand new. And actually, the most important thing is just calm everybody down. Yeah, I think it's probably we were probably okay because it was we knew it was pre-recorded. We know that there's but not... Do it, well, yeah, yeah, you say that, so. but then I remember the first time we did live TV. We, yeah, as we I were, say, that was, that was awful. Because <laughs> they, we, we hadn't, they, hadn't, they hadn't given us any prep for... Like, we'd, uh, literally, our first live TV, TV we did was SMTV Live. Yeah, I'm there's a Danger Mouse t-shirt. The, like, the, the biggest show <laughs> for kids TV. And I can remember right, we had to get there at something silly like five in the morning or something like that. And I remember just being a nervous wreck the entire time, thinking... Don't sw- I don't swear anyway, really, but I was thinking, just don't, don't swear. Don't like anything like that, because yeah. it will all go wrong. And once you get that in your head, you think, that's it. Every second word's going to be a swear word now. That's what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, exactly. And SNTV was brilliant, but it was so chaotic that I can imagine it was quite overwhelming to go in and, and just have all that going on around you and thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? Yeah, yeah and Andrew you're is- not playing a character as well. You're... You're you, as it were. So there's yeah. not there's not that to to fall behind. But in terms of like yourself, though, and as I say, is there a do you develop a, an on screen persona, or do you try and keep it as neutral as or as as you as possible? Yeah, it has to be close to you because you are on as yourself. But there is definitely, and I think you have to have that a little bit because you know there's times when you go in and you're tired mm. and you're fed up or something's happening in your life and you think, oh god, the last thing I want to do is go in and pretend to be happy about something or pretend so there is there is an element of, of that kind of um of, of having a, a persona but also a lot of the time I sometimes forget I'm working and if we've got a really long day and we've been chatting while the match is on and then we come back and do analysis afterwards and you go oh because you said it was uh you said you thought that was a penalty and they go yeah and, you, and then you start chatting to people like you're off air and I and I forget sometimes and then suddenly there might be a pause and I think oh Christ I think I was meant to come yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as a, as a presenter obviously in, and close to the game I guess you get quite privy to inside gossip and things going on at the clubs so when when you see something happening at, at a club and then obviously when you're doing the radio you've got fans ringing in saying giving their two cents on it yeah. and they know nothing about the situation but you do how hard is it not to say look this like say if a player's going through a hard time or whatever and you you can't say that you need to stay neutral but how how difficult is it not to kind of you know say you know give this guy some slack yeah i mean th- there's a couple of things there one is that football is such a gossipy industry Mm. that everybody has something to say about everything and it's well you know I don't think he's happy because of x y and z oh you know I think there's off-field issues there or I think and everybody everybody's got a theory and all these rumors get washed around and around until you get to the stage where you think I think I know what's going on there or I've heard what's going on there but you never really know how how truthfully Mm -hmm. that they're being told how truthful they are um so you have to take everything with a pinch of salt even though it's quite good fun when somebody tells you something really scurrilous and you go really? yes. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's great yeah. but you, but you also know it's probably not true or at least hugely exaggerated um so there's a bit of that there's also um a slightly sort of different angle on that which is that um with dad having played and, and managed um, and usually um, I would be alongside someone who's, who's played. There's an insight into how it affects people. And I think sometimes the biggest thing, or the hardest thing that I used to find was when fans would ring up and just talk about players like they were meat and commodities. Yeah. And, you know, just as though they should be able to just churn everything out, you know, without having anything affect them. I think this year that's been huge and, um, you know, playing without fans, but also with everything that's going on. And you know, I've said a couple of, you can't bang on about it every week. You can't keep making the same point. But a couple of times I've said to people, you know, we all feel rubbish this year. We all feel at times a bit anxious and a bit down and uh, concerned about what's going on. You can't expect that the players don't have that at times, that they're not just a bit, and at times just a bit fed up with everything because it has just been a bit miserable. You know, they've got family abroad that they can't go and see or they have, you know, personal circumstances that they that mean they can't 
go and, and help out members of their family or their friends. And it, it affects anybody. There's a couple, you know, the young players who've come in at Chelsea have moved in the middle of a pandemic. I think one of them's come with his girlfriend and one of them's single, I think. Um, but they've come and they've moved to a new city. They can't go and socialise with their teammates. All they have is training. And they go in and see them at training and then that's it. They go home and just sit in yeah. all the time on their own. It must be so yeah, hard. Yeah, I mean, there's only yeah. so much Call of Duty you can play, really, isn't there, when you're... <laughs> when you're in when you're in that in that scenario but it's i mean it's, yeah bit of fifa and yeah that's thing. it yeah exactly exactly but i mean so i remember it's funny enough you're saying about like seeing issues and everything backstage but it's also the do you find that being from a footballing family shall we say that people almost see you as safe to talk to off camera as in they could say oh no he's, he hasn't been trying in training or something like that whereas sometimes it could be standoffish yeah Sometimes, yeah, I think there is a there's a sort of trust element there where it's pe- people will talk as though, well, you'll know you'll know what this is like, or at least secondhand yeah. you might know what what this is like. But then there's also people who are really suspicious. Yeah. I've you know I've been in a studio where one of the studio guests has talked to the other one who would be somebody I'd know reasonably well behind their hand, sort of talking like mm-hmm. this as though, you know, <laughs> with, and it, and I'm sitting thinking. I don't think there's anything you're saying that's that secret. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> think, did you just? You know, turn, I, I don't think there's anything that. Just turn to the sound guy. Explosive. Just turn to the sound guy and say, "What did he say?" Just got to change your mic there, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's. <laughs> but yeah, it's it it, it's, it happens, but it's um it but not always. Not no, always. no, but I, cause I always find that it's. Do you find that as well that when you're. Obviously, being in the public eye and being a a presenter and an interviewer and stuff like that on all all platforms really do you find that you get people who see you like say delivery man who just dropped off the uh the shopping that type of person would they say oh you, you want to ask them this or such and such didn't do you know what i mean like put, almost tell you what to do or not, do they not is that not a thing not very much um my postman um is lovely he's a big qpr fan and we always have like if we catch up we always have we always have chats about different things but um generally speaking i think it's and, and I know you're saying sort of in the public eye, and technically that's true, but I think you're so far down the pecking order of what people actually tune in for when you work in live sport, because they tune in for the football, yeah. then they tune in to hear what the pundits have got to say about it, and really, I'm just kind of oiling the wheels. It's I'm not, you know, I'm never going to be, or the presenter is is never going to be the person that everybody tunes in to see. You you just happen to be there. You know, they they need somebody to kind of keep everything ticking over, and that's that's your job. So. I mean, in maybe in football grounds where people might expect me to see and they can make that connection in their brain, it probably happens a bit more that people will come and sort of chat, but not, not generally in, in everyday life. Also, I live in West London and it's a bit of a media hotspot and there's much better people <laughs> to kind of chat to. Well, I mean, they just need to get... you. I think you've played in the little par three down the road from me and I think, you know, you go down there and it's full of TV stars and... Um, like actors and properly famous people so they're not really that bothered <laughs> but it, I mean in terms of like you're saying like oiling the wheel like keeping the, the wheels oiled and stuff like that well let's talk about like your your career highlights pretty much I mean as you say you're one of the first people to, to be presenting on Sky Sports news and Sky Sports obviously is still what, one of the biggest radio, uh, radio one of the biggest TV networks I going I was the first person the on first, Sky Sports there you go the first the very, the fir- very first Mike, the yeah. very first Mike Wedderburn and I were the very first two people on Sky Sports there you go, see. and I was terrible <laughs> <laughs> but only, only, only the people in the uh, in the building were watching it there at the time so that's okay yeah, yeah so you can build true. it you can build that it but don't get yourself down because I was going to say cause obviously on Radio 5 Live as well which again is probably different because do you see in text before what the comments are, what they're ringing in to talk about on, say, 6 or 6 or anything A little like bit. So you have a, a sort of preview of a, of a line. Yeah, on, on 6 or 6, so when, when the, the fans are calling in to get their opinion, you get maybe a line of what they're, they're going to talk about. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's, um, you'd sort of prepare for it. But when, when we did 6 or 6, we used to do the, um, the Sunday night because the Saturday show would be really hectic. Everybody had been to the football and everybody was up mm. here. And it would be really fast paced. And and we started, I think, trying to do that a bit on the Sunday. And then one day somebody phoned in and said, um, I was just listening because I'm doing the washing up after the Sunday lunch. And I thought, that's it. That's who we're talking to. That we, and then after that, we deliberately kind of just slowed everything down and thought, 
this is just a weekend wrap up. This is just everybody sort of winding down, starting to get ready to go back to work on Monday and it's just more chilled. And and then, because um, I used to do it with, with Ian Wright, obviously, and um, and Wright is just brilliant. And the two of us, we just used to sit and chat for ages. And we used to get in trouble because I don't think we often got a lot of callers in or as many as we should have done at times because we just kind of go off and start chatting amongst yeah. ourselves. But, that but, also, but that's what's so great about the show, though, is that you can just listen, which surely is... Just, I know, obviously, the producers probably want people to engage in in a talk show, but equally, yeah. it's, as, a, yeah. as a listener, it's great to hear two experts on, on a player and, and another... A, um, what would be your that's a point? What would point? What would be your official like? Are you a journalist? Are you a presenter? Are you a cause... presenter? Presenter on my or when I fill in official documents, I say broadcaster. Okay, yeah. I think it sounds better. Yeah, because I was going to say you. But it's the but I mean you can because you've done. We'll we'll go on to obviously the amazing documentaries that you've done as well. But it's like you've a wide net over everything. It's not like you're just sat in front of a a screen and and read out and that's it. Because I guess that you when you're um, talking to or making sure that three ex-professionals are given their opinion. I guess you yourself can't go off an auto queue because they're not going off it. So you need to stay on online with that no. conversation. No, often maybe, um, especially for a live game, that the top of the show will be scripted. There'll be like a minute or two of scripted stuff at the top, just so that you're on air and it's neat, it's tidy, it fits the pictures and you get on and it's, it's not too bad. Um, and it all looks quite seamless. Um, and but then once you start chatting, you're right. You can't do that because if you put if you put scripted stuff into the middle of a conversation, you can hear the change of gear, and it just feels uncomfortable. And I think the worst thing um, for someone who's on on screen is for people watching to feel uncomfortable watching them. You you want to be relaxed and you want to feel that you're happy in their company and that they have a degree of control over things, or at least if things go wrong, that they're not bothered or flustered by it. So that's that's kind of um, that's what I try to do. But I think in terms of that, you can't you can't have too much ready to go because it just sounds uncomfortable. I yeah, think. I suppose as well that sometimes, say, if you've got a someone else like doing the punditry who's maybe a footballer who's injured, who probably isn't too comfortable in in that environment. So they could so you know you could go to his analysis and it's almost like yeah, he was good. And then you then you got like a minute and a half of dead air to fill. <laughs> Trying to keep that going as well. That to be to be honest, that happens that happens rarely, but it, it has happened where somebody sort of chats off air and they say, Oh my god, what a goal that was, and they break it down move by move and you know, the kind of why the technique's amazing and this. And you think, Oh, that's great. And you go to them and you say, Talk me through that first goal and they go, Yeah, it's just a really well taken goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, you, I, okay. I guess you can I guess it's definitely helped you that um, media training to a degree has come in for a lot of players now because I remember they like say when Sky Sports News first started up if they went to a player it would nine times out of BB uh, yeah it was good and that would be it <laughs> like, yeah. like, it's and you know it's it's interesting because there was a there, there definitely was a time where players relied on the, the press officer at the club just to tell to teach them how not to say things, mm. how to give as little away as possible. But now you have a lot of players who want to go on and have a career in the media, but they also want to develop their brands and to have an identity okay. and to have, you know, to be able, basically to be able to sell stuff off the back of their name. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's basically what it comes down to. Um, and so they want to have a presence. They want to be articulate in, in the media. They want to have a voice. And so that, yeah, that really, really does help. And then also, I think um, there are there are people who are just naturally really good in front of camera, like James Madison at Leicester gave an interview a couple of months ago and he came out, talked about his job, talked about what he had been asked to do, talked about the advice he'd been given, talked about his manager's input, everything, and did it all in a really charming way with a really light touch, just eloquent and interesting and quite witty but not silly. And it was just really, really... It's just a pleasure to watch. And you think, God, there's somebody who's who's got it, who absolutely understands mm. how to do this. And not everybody not everybody does that naturally. And there's no reason why they should. You know, I'm you know, I, I do the media stuff, I can't kick a ball. Mm. So there's no reason why you should have both skills. 
But if you want to develop that side of it, then you, you have to acquire at least a version. Yeah, and I think when you watch, like, say, take, take American sports, for example, like there's, there's a lot of guys who they interview, be it in the NFL, be it basketball or something like that, who do articulate better, I think, than watching, say, say football players because yeah. they're, be it they've gone to college, I don't, I don't know. They, but there's, there's something there, which, or they've been media trained more and more, I don't know, but they just seem to be a bit more, I suppose not necessarily just saying, as you say, telling, being told what to say. Just say, yeah, we worked hard, we'll go again next week. You know, the same cliche. I things. think it's bigger than that, though. I think if you watch any American news channel and they go and interview somebody after some extraordinary situation, they sound like reporters. That like you just grab somebody off the street and say, what happened? Well, and then you get this amazing, detailed, fluent kind of answer. Whereas you come over here and go, yeah, there were, uh, I just heard a noise. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then I looked over. I, I didn't really see very much, but I mean, something's clearly gone on. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's just, I think culturally in, in the States, it's just a much more media friendly society and they're just much more literate in in that way mm. i should mm. talk about the sex obviously you, you present stuff which goes out in america and all over the world do you have to change the way anything's presented for that audience or different audiences yeah i can't <laughs> <laughs> i can't i just don't. there is um i mean there are certain probably certain um things that you don't go near too much i mean if you're going out around the world you're probably not you can refer to the Christmas fixtures, but you have to realise that it doesn't really mean that much to, to people in countries where they don't really celebrate Christmas mm-hmm. that much. So you have to be you have to be sort of culturally slightly sensitive. Um, but other than that, the, no, it, it doesn't it doesn't really change that much. What I have noticed, though, with with doing the, the stuff that goes out around the world is how much more of the feedback is, is positive, mm, whereas mm. Um, you do it in the UK and the feedback is usually moaning about somebody. Yeah. They don't like what somebody said. They don't like how they said it. They don't like somebody's trainers. They don't like whatever it is. It, whatever it is, they just don't yeah. like it. Um, and, th- and there seems to be an awful lot of that. Whereas around the world, it's just people who are just genuinely enthusiastic. I don't mean, and I don't mean positive in a, you know, in, an, in a non-critical way. But, they, but there is a, there's an enthusiasm rather than a cynicism. Yeah, I think it's definitely a trait, I think, which unfortunately, I think a lot of people from... It's amazing. I remember saying this exact same thing to somebody in America and said, no, but over here, guys are so much more enthusiastic and get, getting behind you type thing. Whereas I find it in England, it's almost a bit more... Yeah, you're more, especially on social media, you're a lot likely to hear a bad comment than you are. That was really good. Yeah, and there's also a real element over here of, well, it might be all right, but don't get up yourself. Yeah. You know, just... <laughs> Just yeah. steady and kind, of, which I actually I don't no. mind that. I think that's quite a nice that's quite a nice yeah. thing. But you must you must have seen that like traveling. Oh, loads and and seeing the different reactions in different countries. Absolutely, loads. Like I remember, there's it's 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 quite good that like a lot of the premieres we went to, even though they told us like I remember once we went to a premiere in Helsinki, and they told us now just before we went out because we'd just come from, I think we we're in the Far East or somewhere like that, and they said you know and they they'd obviously heard that the response is really big and you know really over the top they were really enjoying it and they says just be aware that it may be toned down a bit here so we're like okay okay fine and like we we, we got there and it was we they had a, a stage set up where we spoke to the crowd and it was the complete opposite they were just going absolutely mad for it and it was so we we kind of i think we kind of saw because the main target audience when we were doing potter especially was that age group who are very more you're more likely to be a lot more enthusiastic you're more likely to say to show pleasure at something like that. So I suppose we were kind of blinkered from it, but you do see, I suppose, comments from other people about certain avenues you go to, be it over here as opposed to in America. There's there's two different things what people are almost looking at, which is, uh, mm. you know. Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. But I, but I think cause, because what I do is, is based here. Like I work from here, but it goes out elsewhere. Yeah. Whereas you would have been able to go and, like, I don't know, even people approaching you on the street, probably it's, it's different yeah, I mean, where, where you are I found the, the funny thing is that there's, if you're doing, like you're in a country for a, a certain amount of days and you, the media is, spoke, is speaking to you in English but with an accent. And I find yeah. myself trying it's not to speak with that accent, but I know that there was like, um, <laughs> like Jude, Jude, Jude Bellingham um, the other week I saw at Britsia yeah. Dortmund was yeah. answering a question. Well, we played yeah. very well, and it's like what? <laughs> but I can see how he does it because you're you're surrounded yeah. by that accent the whole time, and it makes them 
the guys will understand you probably easier when you're doing I'm it. I'm sure they you won't. Sound like, yeah. Oh, you probably sure. won't, but you do sound like you're from an episode of, of Hello, Hello. But it is, uh, it is like that type of thing. Yeah. But they, um, Steve McLaren, oh, the yeah. famous one, yeah. he did that. He yeah. went over to coach yeah. in Holland and he said, came back and he couldn't show his And it's like, where's that come yeah. from? David Moyes had a go, I think, with one of the players. And he was speaking in English, but to Spanish journalists. Yeah. And it was a Spanish player name. And I'm not even going to do it. But it's just... It's genuinely one of the funny, and he said he did it with a full like shrug and a hand gesture and everything, and it was like, what? What is that? Come but from? stuff like that, but stuff like it's that does funny. it does rub off on you though when you're when you're surrounded by, it. and you yeah. kind of maybe don't realise. Obviously, with the internet, probably twenty years ago, no one would have really probably seen that type of interview apart from an archive. Whereas yeah. now, it's within an hour of it going out, it's all over the place, and everyone's calling you calling you out yeah. on it but in terms of like when you were <laughs> yeah. trying to drag it back on now so in terms of like going to going to new environments i suppose that would be one way of putting it so say being the first female um host on talk sport radio do you find that that was a more of a thing like did, you, did it seem like a big deal to you being the first woman or was it just getting on the radio like being on talk sport was a was the barrier not being a female or was that a barrier to to get through being in a Unfortunately, sports media is perceived, or certainly was anyway, perceived as a male-dominated type of type of thing. Yeah, I can't remember if I knew that I was the first woman to do it. And I think it's because because of that background in Sky Sports News, I did that for, for nine years. And I think Talk Sport was the first thing I did that wasn't Sky, that was outside of that. So it felt like a big deal to me because... And I was really, I, don't, I, I wasn't very good at it. I did it for a year, I think, and then thought, I, this doesn't suit me. I don't suit this. And I kind of wrote off radio for myself because of that. I just thought this isn't, I tried it again. I did a little kind of um, summer stint at, at Five Live Sport where I, I did maybe three or four episodes. And I thought, this is, I can't do this. This is not for me. And it wasn't until I went to 606 that I got a run at it and then, and then, um, decided I really loved it and really enjoyed doing it but um but things like that I don't know when 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 I was going into work it wasn't I wasn't thinking I'm I'm this is it now I'm coming in as the as the first woman yeah. to do this it just wasn't something that I it, it didn't occur to me because so I think it's just I think it, luckily it's a thing what's changing a lot more and I think James and I were kind of I don't know because like when we were growing up like our mum was I sounded real brummy then didn't I our mum she oh um she was she was like a really really hard working woman and never and she, like her 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 position what she she got to in work was a very senior one and i think we've always had that example of there's no women men type thing it's always been the case like my mum i always think of my mum's example is just a case of right that's what i'm good at and i'm going to do it and it's only really years afterwards that i she told me like of stuff she came up against, you know, of people like she, there was this one, uh, this one employer or one guy who worked under her, who it came to her attention and had been sending emails, not very nice about her type thing, and uh, she called her into his office, uh, called, called wow. this this person into her, into her office and said, "Can you just read this email to me, please?" And uh, you know stuff like and that, but that's that's how she dealt with people, you know. It was very much a case of that's yeah. amazing. And so to to me the whole empowering women in TV in positions and stuff like that I suppose to to a one degree we've kind of been obviously being male anyway we don't see that point of view to begin with but also having that example from my mum is very much a case of there is always an opportunity there to go and get it type of thing is that is that a fair representation yeah yeah and there's yeah definitely I think there's there's a there's a couple of things one is that growing up in a football world I never had that sense of not belonging that I think a lot of women talk about, that sense of trying to fight to get on the inside mm. because I'd grown up in it. And whether whether people treated me or thought of me as being on the inside, it never it it, it just didn't occur to me that I wasn't because that was the world I'd, I'd grown up in. So I think I didn't have to get over that. That was an obstacle I didn't have to get over. Um, and then once I was there, I just... I don't know, I think there's... I think there's a... Um, I think I had a sort of naivety about things where I just didn't, I just didn't see mm. it. I'm, I'm fairly sure there were instances, but I, I just didn't see them because I was a little bit kind of oblivious to the whole thing. I just kind of 
got my head down and, and did my job. And then I think some of the experience that other women have talked about, I find genuinely shocking. Yeah. That you know, because I know that I know now that my experience wasn't typical, and lots of women found it very difficult. But I think with me, it was there was a um, there was that that sense of it being a world I was really comfortable in, but also just not noticing stuff and I think that really helped me I think if I'd paid attention it maybe would have knocked me a lot more mm. Mm. <clears throat> I mean it's still, it's still shocking that here we are so, um, this year still. and it's, it's still a thing like it is it is it is absolutely yeah. ludicrous um, but I mean cause we've got we've got fortunately lots of um, female listeners who who get in touch so hopefully they're they're listening to this thinking and maybe they've maybe they've come across people who have been like oh, you, you don't know what you're talking about you're a woman do you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, yeah. right, so you do. You do. Yeah. do. And I think, but I think, you'll, I think you'll get that. And I think, you know, um, lots of people want to know, you know, how, how do you deal with online abuse or how do you deal with sexism? Or, and I think, I think because of what we were talking about earlier with, with the way things are in, in terms of how people talk about people who are on the television, you will get abuse. And, it, and if you... Are male or female, you will you will get abuse. But if you're female, there will be an extra layer to it, which is there will be sexist abuse in there. Um, and really, there's there's not an awful lot you can do about it because it will always it will always affect you. It will always make you feel bad, but it shouldn't affect what you do. Mm. You can you can only control what you do and how you do your job. There's nothing you can do about it. But I think trying to pretend it doesn't bother you. Is, is a waste of time that's just exhausting it's just it's not it's not a good use of your energy but it, it's normal to feel affected by it but it, as long as you put all your energy into not letting it affect what you do and how you do your job and how you perceive yourself then I think that's the that's the only way really that you can you can deal with it definitely and I'd say when we're talking about the <clears throat> all the things that you've done um, the documentary you did on Hillsborough was the best uh documentary i've ever listened to like it was it was so good because i i remember i was driving i still remember to stay i was driving i had it on the in the car and i actively made the journey longer so i probably endangered like gave more co2 out than i should have done but <laughs> I, I made the journey longer so i could listen to it because it was that powerful and that in depth and i, I recommend anybody to listen to it because it was that good did do you mind if i ask about that like what was that like to to, to make for you being involved as seeing it from not straight on but I guess from the side as it were um at, at the house and everything like what was what was that like um no that that was a really um it was really important to me to get that right and there was a producer a guy called Tim Peach who worked on it who was fantastic and the research that he'd been putting into it for I think he'd made something similar or, or started the kind of the, the bones of it a couple of years before um, and I had worked in the meantime on that. And so he put together the very best guests that we could possibly have talking about the subject. There was somebody who'd done lots of academic research on it. There was a journalist who'd investigated and followed the, the trial it was at the, at the time, followed that. Then there were um, survivors and, and family members of pe uh, you know who'd lost people in the disaster. And it, they, just, they just talked beautifully and emotionally and um with real insight and it was just I just feel really privileged to have worked on it because the people that, that made that documentary were the were the were the guests and they and they just to tell to tell a story that is that awful is um and to tell it in the way that they did was was just incredible mm. I think. I th yeah that's a, it's a, yeah a, trying to figure out what was so I don't want to say good about it because it was nothing you know, as a production. Sorry, that's what I, I, mean. I know. But it was very it was it was hugely affecting. I think I think the way they spoke, um, being in the studio with the with the people we were talking to, the way that they they spoke, even being in the studio, it, it drew you in. Mm. It put you in, in the, that most awful of, of positions. But I think the um, the resilience of them and the the sort of outlook that that they had, I think, was was inspiring. The sort of the the way that they they talked about it and the way that they talked about the future and 
the way that they talked about um, remembering the event and 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 living with that, where I think was 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 yeah, incredible. Yeah, that's the the, sho- the the really shocking thing about the whole the whole event was that the um, it didn't just finish on the day, did it? It was like there's a mass like if, for those listening in in the start, I'll put it in American terminology. Um, it would be like going to say the AFC or the NFC Championship game, so the game, the semi final before the big event type thing, and before kickoff, unfortunately, ninety six fans get crushed to death, and then there's subsequently, obviously, you've got that obviously on the day, and then there's a police cover up, there's a media complete disgusting reporting going on, lies, everything being thrown forward, and just tarnishing the name of not just not just fans but a city. Of Liverpool themselves, and, not just, and that's when it went beyond football as well. Yeah, it did. And it, um, when we when we talked, when we when we made the documentary, it was over twenty years later, and they had finally got the the justice mm. that they'd been fighting for. And throughout that time, so over two decades, they'd been told, just let it go. Just, just look. You're not going to win this. Just let it go. And they'd had setback after setback after setback in that in that time, and kept going, kept on going, kept on going, until finally they got the the verdict that they that they should have got in the, in the first place. Um, and I think maybe that's that's something because I, I remember I remember driving up the motorway to go to work to 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 put um, to to do the documentary to to record the documentary because we couldn't. We couldn't do it. We didn't know what the verdict was going to be, and we thought, well, if if this doesn't go, the you know, if this isn't isn't the the right outcome, we we can't put this this documentary out. So, I was driving up the the motorway, and I didn't realise how much it had affected me, and I had to pull over. I was sobbing in the on the hard shoulder because I couldn't I couldn't drive. It was just that relief. I just sort of I kept hearing the the. The verdicts. There were about there, there were there were a few of them, and they just kept coming through and kept coming through and kept coming through. And even now, I get um, goosebumps thinking about it. And I think that um, catharsis, that relief, I think that was maybe something that came across without really talking about it yeah. in in detail. But I think that maybe came through. And I think that was the, the yeah that maybe that that was part of it. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. What was it? Was, exactly it was fantastic. What made you, yeah. Well, what was it what made you want to... I mean, obviously, you know, the story needed to be told, um, but what was it what made you feel that, that you wanted to do it, that you wanted to have that involvement to it? Um, because they asked me. Right. <laughs> um, because Tim, who, who produced it, said, okay, yeah. said do, do you want to do it? But no, you, you're right, though. It wasn't... It it was something that I had to think about. Yeah, I was going to say because I can't, not, I can't, not I can't long, imagine... Because it, you're right, I did want to... I can't to... imagine it would have been an easy, snap decision, what with your dad being the manager at the time and you know yeah and I and I yeah but but at the same time it wasn't it wasn't didn't take me long to think about it but I was worried about doing it um Mm. because because the same reasons for doing it were the reasons that I was nervous about doing which was that it was something that I understood what it meant and how important it was and I was desperate to get it right and so frightened of, of getting it wrong and so that it was the the flip side of the same yeah. coin. Well, you definitely got it right. You definitely got it right. Oh, it was, you. and I'd, honestly, I'd recommend anybody to to listen to it because it is. I say I've got goosebumps just talking about it. Like it was, it was uh, yeah. very very well done. Um, but oh, thank you. They worked. They spoke brilliantly. <laughs> but over the years, though, you've been involved in a lot of other campaigns to promote women, women to promote women in sport, uh, football in particular, such as UEFA's We Play Strong campaign. Could could you tell us a little bit about that and how you became involved and if you think enough's been done now to promote women in sport and especially football in the UK and, and around the world? Yeah, I think there's um there's a there's a few different campaigns which is, you know, trying to get um women and girls in particular into into football and in and like I said with, with my daughters they, they still don't quite feel when they're in the playground that it's a hundred percent it's not closed to them but it's not completely open to them it's not a, a completely level playing field to, to coin a phrase but um and and there's also a lot of um women who give up sport once they get to the age of 14 it drops off hugely and so there's an element of wanting to keep 
young girls fit apart from apart from anything else and football is a, a great way to do that because we know that the um the number of women who are watching football is, is going up we know the participation of, of women at one stage it was the fastest growing sport in the country was women's football i don't know if that's still the case um so i think it, it is happening and it and it is changing but i think football is just a, a great one for girls to get involved with because it doesn't require much you know you don't really need a lot of structure to go out and, and kick a ball around you know it's not hockey it's not netball you know you don't need to have specific equipment you can just go and you know create a couple of goals or even one goal and and just kick a ball around it's it it's an easy one to do yeah definitely is, is there anything that you would change in football you you yourself if you, do you see something you think oh that would be good Ooh. to change var yeah i i well <laughs> I I don't I don't mind VAR. My issue is I don't think the rules no, suit VAR. No. I think what VAR's shown up is that the laws of the game aren't. No. <laughs> I don't want to say I don't want to say as strong as the laws of the game aren't fit for purpose. But I mean, it's kind of, they 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 don't stand up to that level of scrutiny. Ideally, and this won't happen, but ideally they would go back to the very basics and then build it from scratch to kind of say right this is. This is what we need to do because the problem now is you've got you've got a law on top of a law on top of a law and then on top of that you get advice given to the referees for them to look <laughs> for different things. Well, it's like it just, the um, it just leads to so much inconsistency. It was like the uh, the Man City Aston Villa game earlier this season when City scored a goal from like oh my god that game <laughs> half a mile oh, offside. I was working. <laughs> I was working I was working on the radio for that game and we were covering it and the word came out from the sort of governing body this we, there's no, we don't need to go into it but, but this is this is what's happened everybody who's got anything to do with football said that's offside mm. that that is close then the the explanation came out it's not offside because x y and z um, and this would never this is by the law by the letter of the law this is not offside yeah. so we all said right fine we can see what the law that you've applied there. We understand why you've applied it. Nobody's comfortable with it, but okay. It then happened. Was it? It was Villa against Newcastle, and it went the other way in the next yeah, game. Jamal Sells. Uh, no, wasn't Jamal Sells. It was, Sells. Um, it was um, Fabian yeah. Scher. Fabian Scher. Yeah. It was for Newcastle against Villa. The same thing happened, and we all went. Oh, and we know because of the game against Manchester City that this is the law and now it's evened itself up and it's gone in Aston Villa's yeah. favour. Fine, all good. Within a couple of <laughs> days, the law. big announcement, <laughs> we've decided to change the law. Yes. So we've all made ourselves look like idiots and it, and none of it makes any sense. And, and, and in, a, you know, in one sense, it's good that they've gone back to something that intuitively feels right. But at the same time, you made everybody look like idiots. Yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> but by which I, I mean, mean, I really, <laughs> I really like to watch it. Like we're talking about the win, the women's game. Just like there's so much less play acting and mouth enough, and just almost getting on with it. Which to watch as a free, yeah. in terms of like skill level as well, it's obviously a lot better. Well, getting better progressively, certainly the major tournaments as well. Yeah, um, I think they're just a joy yeah. to watch. Yeah, definitely. There is there is a lot less play acting. And I think there's been less play acting when there's no crowds in the game, mm -hmm. uh, when there's no crowds in the ground. I think in the, in the men's game, it's it, there still is. I tell you what's taken over from it is shouting. Because it's in an empty stadium and your voice carries, it's ah, really loudly. <laughs> How? And then the referee, but it catches the referee's eye and they, uh, they catch the referee's ear. And then they turn around and think, well, something must yeah. have gone on. How weird is it as a presenter, go, like presenting at a game, like literally while, just before a game goes on, you're not meant to be able to hear yourself think. Whereas now there's nothing. Like, is that, is that really, is it, have you oh, got used to it yet or is it still? It's weird. Yeah. No, most, mostly I'm in the studio. So you can it, it's slightly different, but I've done quite a few games now where you're in the stadium and it is weird because you, you don't realize how much you rely on the rhythm of the crowd and the noise, you know, to kind of, you work out where you are. So if you've got an hour build up, you start at the beginning, fans are sort of coming in, there's a bit of music, there's whatever. Usually you're kind of adjusting all your, earpiece and your microphone and everything because suddenly the noise starts to go up the PA system gets cranked up and then before kickoff you've got no chance you know they're sort of just throw to the commentators <laughs> and I'm thinking oh I don't know I'm usually I'm usually kind of um 
like not in vision, but down a camera lens somewhere, just going back into the into the sort of control truck and kind of waving at my ears, going, I can't hear anything. I don't know what you're saying to me. So sometimes I just throw in a in a random sense. But um yeah, so it's it's normally like that and you feel that build. So you you're or I, I used to think that my energy levels would build as you got closer to the gate, and that feels natural. But when it's just silent. And the weirdest thing as well is that some grounds do the big announcements. Yeah, well, yeah. So <laughs> they'll sit there and they'll go, your Aston Villa team for yeah, today yeah. is number one. And you think, you think, who are you doing this for? There's like a there's a crowd of like 20 cynical journalists sitting in a press box and that's well, it. They've all got the sheet anyway. There, there was a game I was watching the other <laughs> yeah. day. I can't remember which game it was, but there was like a gap in play and there was music being played in the background. It was bizarre, yeah. but I still, I still yeah, think... I think a few people have put... A few clubs who don't normally have goal music have got goal music this yeah. season because <laughs> why not? I mean, I still, I still think that they've, they've missed a chair, they've missed a trick with the whole. Obviously, due to COVID rules, they can't walk in at the same time. All oh, my blinds are shutting. Um, that's that what, what that, that noise is. is. Yeah, they'll come down at sunset and it's going down. Now, hang on. Right. Should they not be down when the sun's out? Is that they're not? more just like? They're more just so people. He likes to show off. Really. Yeah, let's show off. <laughs> it's really <laughs> yeah. moody where I'm now. Just got my broom covered. Um, it's like my um, my great granny used to put her curtains around the other way yeah. so that people. She's like, "What's the point in having nice <laughs> curtains true, yeah. that nobody sees?" <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. Um, but no, I mean, I, th- I think they missed a, they missed a trick though in terms of like when the teams come out. Obviously, with COVID rules, they can't come out at the same time. So you could have like the opposition come yeah. out, and then when the home team come out, they could have like you know smoke shattering glass effects all that lot going on like make it really the other way but anyway that's that's for another day but well wolves well, 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 wolves, wolves, wolves do, used to do with a firework a light, they? they do a light show oh that's good yeah. yeah they still do they do the they do the light show at night still. oh that's good exactly. Mike. but what would you what would you say going back to your your interviewing techniques for anyone listening as well who's getting into um no i know you didn't say journalism but that type of thing what would you say are your top tips for giving like the best interviews um Preparation always is the is the one, um, and I I'm not somebody who likes to go in with a really strict idea of what what I'm going to do, especially for something like that that is sort of that you, you're talking about sort of longer form things because post match interviews where you've got three questions it's like short and sharp. What happened? How did it happen? Mm. Now what? That's basically your, your questions. Um, but when it's when it's longer and you're trying to get something out of people, I think having loads of prep, even if you don't use it, like most of the time you are ridiculously overprepared because you don't use any of the stuff. You've just got lots of bits that you can you can call on if a situation arises. Um, so preparation is really good. Um, I, I like a really loose structure. So I like just topics that I might sort of cover with people rather than actual questions, unless there's something specific or unless it's a difficult topic that I want to be able to phrase the question properly you know, to get to get a nice answer. And then and then listening. Because people say things that you don't expect and you want to be able to to react mm-hmm. to it. So yeah, I, I mean it's not it's not difficult, but it's a it's a learned skill that you practice, I think. Mm, definitely. We're still learning as you can yeah. tell. I was gonna say I'm just gonna finish making those notes <laughs> no, now. I, yeah, no, I don't so. think and so. Listening at all. was the last one. I was like, okay, okay, I'll put that there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that's just proving you <laughs> yeah, were. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Kelly, what's uh, as, you know this is called normal, not normal. What's the most normal thing about you? Um, I think the most normal thing that happens in in an in an abnormal situation is at the moment um, because of COVID. Um, I'm doing all my radio broadcasting from home, so I do it from my my kitchen table. And often I'll go on air on Five Live for a live Champions League night and everything. And I'll go on and I'll introduce the guests and we're going to go to the Etihad and we're going to do this and run the things. And my kids are sitting eating pasta across the table from me, <laughs> sort of rattling their plates. <laughs> because life has to go on. I can't, I can't starve them. That's against the law. So they have to, they have to eat. You should- <laughs> so that's kind of... Um, the most normal thing I do in an abnormal situation. I think. You should get your girls to play like pretend they're doing fan noises in the background. Yeah. And they should be in the background, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They should do the, like you said, the smoke and broken glasses. Yeah, yeah, get all that in there. Yeah. So, what would, what would you say then is the least normal thing about you? Because I mean, to me, presenting a Champions League game while you've got pasta being eaten right next to you in your kitchen—it sounds pretty abnormal. But you may you may have something different. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is, but it feels it feels 
very it's the norm it's the contrast that I sort of thought was the the thing I think probably the 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 most abnormal thing is um the the sort of access at games especially when we do the, the do the matches and we present them pitch side and managers and players are coming over and chatting and that's something that you have to keep reminding yourself isn't isn't normal because it's it's a normal part of my everyday working life but for lots of people to be in a position where I don't know Jurgen Klopp comes over and says yeah I'll come and have a chat to you how are you how is everybody and you and you have a look that's that's not normal so you have to keep reminding yourself that you're there because people can't be you're there as a representative mm. really to, to try and get get answers out of him and and not to sort of take that for granted I th- at the same time try and Trying to be quite relaxed so you don't come across as good. Yeah. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm standing here talking to you. This is amazing. I did love that when... That would wear thin. I did love it when Liverpool were... They'd won the Premier League and they're about to lift the trophy and you were speaking to Jurgen Klopp, the manager, and you literally had to say to him, do you want to go and essentially lift the trophy? <laughs> well, they played... Well, they played, you, they played you'll never walk alone, which is the sort of Liverpool anthem, and they had this real moment. And the rest of the squad, that all of them, all the players all the backroom staff, everybody, they all had arms around each other, sort of facing each other, singing and sort of celebrating together. And I was like, I can't... And um, Matt, who's the, the, the um, press officer at Liverpool, was sort of waving at me to say, that's what's happening over in the corner. So I looked and I thought, I, I can't be the person <laughs> who drags him away from that. And also, but also there is, a, there is a technical point there, which is when at the end of the season they do all the montages... They do a big shot of the whole Liverpool squad and there's no Jurgen Klopp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looks a bit weird. So I was like, do you want to go to the... And meanwhile, my producer's going to me, oh, for God's sake, we've got to get to a break. How can we... You've to... Right, oh my God. So he's, <laughs> he's on the phone to... like when, when it's live like that, you've got to get so many breaks in and you've got to get them in in a certain time and it's all got to... And he's, he's on the phone to like the transmission desk at Sky saying, right, we're going to have to do this. And he's trying to... I don't know, or, you know, it's, there's a legal requirement to do all this stuff. And I've just merrily, off the off my own bat, gone, yeah, crack on, Jürgen, you go and enjoy yourself. Don't you worry about this. Yeah. No thought to my employers at all. No, okay. I'm sure he was very thankful as well, though. I, I think he was, he sort of said afterwards, I said, no, I, I know exactly what you were saying, but it's like, like you were talking about, that, that moment when everything's really noisy and chaotic, it all kind of gets lost mm, a bit. Definitely. Uh, so, I... I always ask people these 3 a.m. questions. I said, I'm really happy I sent them to you. Yeah. So I normally forget. So Yes, um, you did. I wasn't sure if I had to pretend they were sort of... You can do you now. Can pretend, yeah. but <laughs> just change the answer if you want, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give it more thought. No, I didn't, I didn't send the answers. I had a little thing. Uh, okay, cool. No, no, no. Um, so, Kelly, what is your favourite food? Um, I love Thai food. Any kind of just Thai... I just love it. Um, that's my, my favourite. Anything kind of... I, I don't have a sweet tooth at all. Anything that's kind of spicy. I literally will put, like, lemon, chilli and salt on pretty much everything that I eat. Just to, I just love it. It's my, my favourite thing. Not You know, not weird. Not like a meringue yeah. or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Make that a try now. Yeah, anything savoury. Yeah, <laughs> yeah chilli meringue. Well, maybe. Um, what is your favourite book? Um... Now, when you sent these through, I, I do read quite widely and I do read um, quite serious books and literary books and that kind of thing. I'm waiting for a bus. But I thought, really, if I, if I, said, that, <laughs> yeah, if I said that was my favourite, then I would be lying. Because the book I go back to more than any other is a book by Marion Keyes called Rachel's Holiday. And that is my go-to sort of um, go-to book. It's about, it's, in theory, it's, I mean, what you would kind of dismissively describe as chiclet, which she hates as a phrase anyway. Um, but it's about a woman, and it doesn't sound like it's a particularly light topic because it's about a woman who's in a, um, in a, a, a recovery centre, recovering from addiction. <laughs> but it's very, very funny and very warm and lovely. And I just, I love her writing. I think she writes about people in a really fantastic way. So I'm going to say that one. I, because I could pretend, but I'm no, not no, going go to. Go for the one you like, yeah. Uh, what's your favourite song? Yeah, exactly. Oh, my favourite song. I didn't think about this one. I have, um, I change. I don't have a favourite. Like, I find that really, really hard to answer because it completely depends 
on my mood. Yep. I do love Higher and Higher by Jackie Wilson. You know that one, your love keeps lifting yeah. me high? Because if I put that on, no matter what mood I'm in, just the bit at the beginning goes, did it, did it, did it. And I go, oh, I'm in a really good mood again. <laughs> so I think that's the one that whatever, whatever the, whatever frame of mind I'm in, that one will make me happy. Very good. That actually used to be my ringtone. The, the bit, you know, you know when the saxophone kicks in or the trumpets did kick it, in. It. Yes. <laughs> that, but, um, oh, I love that It song. once went off in a, I had a casting and it went off halfway through, which... Yeah. Everyone was in, oh but then, and that's changed ever yeah. since because everyone was more interested. Oh, what a good song that is! I haven't heard that in a while. Oh yeah, it's completely great took one. away from my audition. But the thing is, I can't, I can't put songs I love on as a ringtone because I get sick yeah, of them. So, because then you get you start to associate them with the, with the calls you don't want and with the chores of kind of. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because nobody really likes phone calls, do they? <laughs> <Yeah>. Send a text. <laughs> uh, what is your favourite film? Um, similarly to the. Um, to the book one I don't want to go for anything I love love When Harry Met Sally I love oh, that film it's so, it's it's, again so it's one of those well. ones that I go to so that, yeah and that one and the other one that I always watch whenever it's on at whatever stage it's at is Bridesmaids I just love that film it's so good with them yeah, Kristen yeah. Vegan it just it just really really makes me laugh but um but yeah, when Harry met Sally, I love that one. It makes me feel good. It's a kind of, and I think over the last year, that's I've kind of gravitated to all those things that just make me. I don't want anything difficult. I don't want anything traumatic. I don't want anything bad to happen. And if it does, I want to know it's going to be resolved. Very good. And what is your favourite quote? Um, the one about um, not taking advice from no, not taking criticism from people you wouldn't go to for advice, which well, I think I like is that. a. Great I love quote, that yeah. quote. Yeah, like that one. Yeah. Yeah, just it's a it's a good um, it's a good life lesson. You can get it makes makes it easy to dismiss idiots. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, <laughs> Kelly, thank you so so much for joining us this week. Thank you so much for asking me. I've had a really lovely time. Thank I've you. Really enjoyed it. Is there anything that you want to get in? Um, I did. My 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 daughters did one. If they they wanted to ask you two a question, okay. They they wanted to ask because they've been spending so much time homeschooling, and they've missed all their classmates, and they've really missed being in that environment. Um, how it was for you guys when you had to learn on set and did you miss your school? Oh, great uh, question. Oof, I think short answer, did I miss my school? No. Um, but the... No, you say... No, no, the thing is, <laughs> no, you say no, that. No, I no, thought no, I, I say would. That. I but, say that. But, but I, missed, I missed going to school. Not necessarily school itself, but I missed the whole mm. environment of being at school and, like with you say, mates. not being with yeah. your mates. And even the silly little things like the five, ten minutes in between the different lessons of mucking around or something like that because when we were I guess exactly the same as, as homeschooling when we were filming we had lessons going on at the studios if you had to do an hour of English then an hour of maths it would be like that put one book away and bring the other one out whereas at school obviously you can mess around for 10 minutes and I think I, I probably found as well that I did better at the subjects that I enjoyed when I was at the studios than I didn't than the subjects I didn't enjoy, shall we say, because there's no one really keeping like we had we had we had tutors at the studios, but they weren't exactly gonna say that's 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 rubbish, that did again. It was it was like one of those things they'd like yeah. try and bring it out of you. So I can kind of understand what yeah, I, I bet that a lot of a lot of guys who've been homeschooling these this past year or so have probably found the same thing. So if they are still going through anything like that, is I'd say try and show a bit of interest because I look back at it now and I regret some of the subjects that I didn't try my hardest at. In general, though, it'd be good to actually... I, w I wish I tried harder with a lot of the other subjects. That'd be it. Oh, thank you so much for answering that. They're going to be delighted. That's but a great I, question. They, they answered your question. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's really good. That's really good. <laughs> oh, okay. well, Kelly, again, thank you so much for, for coming on. Really enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And me too. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that today with Kelly. Very good. That was... That was real. I just, we just got lost in time, didn't we? Just uh, chatting about anything and everything. Like I'm sure many of you know, Oliver and I are big sports fans, and watching Kelly and listening to Kelly over the years, um, it was great just to speak to someone that it kind of felt like we already knew her because obviously, like Oliver said as well, that you know, on the the sports shows that we like to watch and and listen to as well. So it was great, you know, and you you've know like you know of someone for ages, and then you meet them, and they're even nicer than you expect them to be. It was that was really good. Yeah, and I, I want to say as well, a big shout out as well to Kelly's two lovely girls who had that lovely question for us 
at the end we're always like as we said we love a bit of uh participation into it and the girls have uh we say well kelly was saying as well how they they listen to the podcasts so uh, it's very nice to have somebody on who uh has something another question for us i suppose is always nice and a really good one yes <laughs> yeah cause you, yeah at least at least it wasn't like what do you have for breakfast it was, it was no, it was very, a re- it was very, generally very, very a really good, like, very, very really good question. Out. So, guys, thank you very much for uh, asking that, and thank you very much for listening. Um, but going back to to our chat with Kelly, it was just it was just nice to kind of ask questions which we've always wanted to ask, especially people in who work in football. Obviously, we're very big football fans, or soccer, if you're watching this in North America. Um, but we, you know, we, we just enjoy all aspects of the of the game, not just the 11 versus 11 on the pitch, but actually what goes into making it, what goes into making a a production to give such great coverage, both on the radio, because when Kelly talks about 505 or 606. So this is where it gets a bit confusing. BBC uh, in the UK, their TV and radio, and the radio channel is 505 or 5 Live. And the show that Kelly presents is called 606. So that's where, if you got confused, that's what that was on about. And normally, when you're back in, when before we're in the kind of world room right now, on the way back from the football, you would put on 606 to listen to what's gone on at other games and listen to fans calling in, basically saying how bad their team is. Because very rarely does a fan <laughs> call in and say, oh, they were brilliant today. I've never seen a best performance. It's normally, yeah, it's normally, oh, this was bad. He was bad referee was bad something like that <laughs> ownership's bad it's uh yeah it, it goes all around so i mean james would know more about listening to that type of stuff being a birmingham city fan definitely there's so many things to take away from listening to that was not just about how again asking about when you're interviewing somebody going there so so i'm sure there is there is somebody listening to this who is hoping to to get a career in journalism, in broadcasting in general. So please take heed of things that Kelly was talking about. Like if you have an interview with somebody, and we've had it ourselves happen on this a couple of times, you go in with, you try and do as much research, research, yes is the word, but also just get to know as much as you can about that person. And hopefully you'll have as much time as possible to ask these questions and just be aware that there are probably going to be some questions which you're not going to have time to answer, to ask. But it's great to get a whole whole and round and basically just go in there knowing everything. I think everyone has seen the story about when Oliver and I were doing an interview and the journalist hadn't done any prep whatsoever and started asking Oliver and myself, were we actually twins? I stand by my answer. To which we said, no, we met at the audition. And unfortunately, she went with that being the truth. So it's always great. And also the people that are being interviewed really do appreciate it when you do your homework as well. Exactly. So, yes, that was very, very good. Now, James, seeing as you had a bit of a rant earlier, I've got a did you know? Uh, okay, I've got a couple as well. So you do yours and then I'll do mine. And we'll okay, have so a here did is, you know here, off. Here is this year's did you know? The first hot air balloon flight was in the 19th of September, 1783, which at the time actually, right, so it was noted as the first aerostatic flight. So the first ever one ever conducted was carried out by the Montgolfier brothers in Versailles, France, in 1783. Okay, interesting. Very good. It went it went up, if that's what you're asking. And then Thank down. you for that. Did you know, Oliver? That was um there you go. Okay, but Boom. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this back round. Mm-hmm. So my did you know this week is about football or soccer, depending where you are in the world. So did you know in the 1950 World Cup, India withdrew their team because they were not allowed to play barefooted. Hey? Yep. There's that one. Since 1982, the World Cup final has had at least one Bayern Munich player in the starting lineup. Very good, very good. You know I'm a big space fan. I'm sure many people know this right now. So did on, you let know? Me guess. Let me guess, let me guess. The International Space Station goes over a football ground every 25 minutes. Probably, I guess, but I'm not sure that's fact. No, what I'm going for is that 
There are five asteroids named after people in football. Oh, go on, what are so, they? So you have the asteroid 14282, Cruyff, after uh, Johann Cruyff. Johann Cruyff. Then there is the 10635 Pepe Beacon, after the Austrian Czech legend. And then there is the 82656 Piscas, after Ferenc Piscas. Yep. 79647 Balak, after Germany's midfielder Michael, Michael Balak. Michael Balak. Michael Balak. Yep. And finally, there is an asteroid which circles in orbit between Mars and Jupiter called the 33179 Arsene Wenger, after Arsenal's manager, or former manager, Arsene Wenger. Arsene Wenger. I've just finished, I've just finished listening to his audio book, actually. Does he mention he's got an asteroid named after him? Arsene. He doesn't, you know. He doesn't mention he's that. So, so big time, isn't he? I mean, you'd start with that, surely. Yes, I, you know, yes, oh. I, I managed in France, in Japan, in England. But I've got an asteroid named after me, which is going... Well, into... the, reason, the reason that was is because the guy who discovered it was actually a huge Arsenal fan. Mm. So hence he named it after Arsenal Wenger. Um, one for you, Oliver. You probably know this already, been a bit of a nerd. But Aston Villa, the second yeah. best team in Birmingham. Aston Villa. <laughs> so they were founded in 1874, as you know, under Oliver. A under a lamppost. They were founded by cricketers. I did. They're called the Villa, Villa Cross... Wisleyan cr Chapel cricket team and they and got Perry together Bell. to discuss how to keep fit during the winter months and they saw yeah. a football game being played in a meadow close by and decided that was the perfect solution it was because and that is actually why because in a cricket team there are 11 players and that is why traditionally there are 11 players in a football team to fill all the which roles. brings and, it round to and, my final and, fact and, Oliver and, hang on hang on hang on one more one more one more one more uh they were founded by a chap called William McGregor. There's a statue of him outside of Villa Park. And he was one of the founding members of the Football League. He also founded Rangers Football Club up in Scotland. Anything else? Well, you go and say that they were 11 people who used to play cricket. So then that's why it ended up being 11 people played football. But yes. England, so England is known as the home of football. This is given because they, uh, England wrote the modern day rules for it. Yes. However, it is widely believed that it was actually invented in 476 BC in China, and it was called Kaju. That is my did you know facts for the day. But today's chat with Kelly, I think, was was absolutely fantastic. Really enjoying, enjoyable to hear. Like I say, the the documentary that she helped make about the Hillsborough disaster. It's it's on online now. It's called Hillsborough: The Truth, and it is. It's a, it's a it is such a um, historic event in English football anyway, but it's such a power and not just English football, but in English modern history. So I thoroughly recommend people to listen to it, and also that a lot has been um, said in it as well about the city of Liverpool and everything. But Kelly's dad was the manager of Liverpool at the time, and he and Kelly's mum. Um, they did so much for the families of those who were um, affected by the Hillsborough disaster. So, again, it goes into detail about that as well in the documentary. But it just shows how in, embedded into Liverpool as a city the whole family is. But as a as a piece of audio listening, I definitely, definitely recommend you checking it out. Yeah, but I think it it, it just shows, though, how... Everything that goes on with sport, it doesn't have to just be about facts and, and numbers on the on the pitch, essentially about who's starting this game, who's going to that, about the culture of different teams all over the world. Like, did you know Neil Armstrong wanted to take a football on the moon? Uh, apparently you want to bring a football. Rubbish. Rubbish. Oh, hi, like NASA. Do you mind if I put a ball in? And may need a pump, actually, because the pressure may... I mean, you can't even take a football in the overhead of compartment on an aeroplane in case it explodes with the pressure. So let alone taking it on a space journey well so the story goes he wasn't allowed to because it was deemed not it was deemed not american enough right yeah, right so, so why didn't he take an american football apparently there is a pin from a team which he was an honorary member of of international so it was revealed when neil armstrong visited buenos aires 
an Argentinian football team, Independiente, Independiente, that's how I pronounce it. Anyway, they made him, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, honorary members of their team. And he was told, he was, he actually said to the club, actually, that they sent him and all their families kits and all that kind of stuff as honorary members. So then when he went to the moon, he actually left a tiny pendant of the team on the moon. Before he went, they the the club allegedly said, "We want to make you honorary life members." The whole the whole um, team, so the three members of Apollo Eleven. Yeah. And so then, when they went to the moon, apparently he left this little pin on there, and he this is what apparently he told them when he went to Argentina later on. Come you know on. The, you know, the, you know the saying. You know the saying. It's like a needle in a haystack. Well, when yeah, people go, eventually one, go back yeah. to the moon, well, when people go back to the moon, maybe they can find this pin, and then you will be proved wrong. Yeah. Well, thank you for ruining this fact. I believe him anyway, so I'm going to go with okay. that. Sure. If I sure. went to the moon, I would take a random team's badge. Why, if random? they made me honorary life member. All I know is, guys, thank you so much for joining us this week. I've been Oliver Phelps. <laughs> he has. And looking up at the moon this week, looking for that pin, I have been James Phelps. Kelly Case, thank you so much for joining us this week. And guys, we will see you soon. (laughs) 